What do Babe Ruth, Jimi Hendrix, and the man in the mound at Sutton Hoo have in common? I'm Sue Brunning, curator of the European Early Medieval Collections at the British Museum, and this is my corner. So today we are doing a sequel to my previous episode all about early Anglo-Saxon swords. But today we're actually going to be looking at the most famous Anglo-Saxon sword ever discovered. And that's the sword from the Sutton Hoo ship burial, which is laid out beautifully in front of me here. Now for those of you who perhaps don't know what the Sutton Hoo ship burial is, it was a grave that was made in the eastern part of England in a county called Suffolk, which at that time was part of the East Anglian Kingdom in Anglo-Saxon England. Now to call it a grave is to sell it short slightly because it was actually no ordinary grave. It was actually a grave made in the middle of a 27 meter long ship that was buried beneath a gigantic earth mound. And inside a burial chamber that was placed in the middle of the ship were laid out some amazing treasures drawn from all over the known world at that time. And one of those pieces was this magnificent sword. And the quality and the quantity of the pieces that were laid out inside that burial chamber were so great that the speculation is that actually what we have here is the burial of an early Anglo-Saxon king of East Anglia. So let's look a little bit more closely at the sword itself. So here we have the blade of the sword, which is made from iron. And of course, the reason that it looks like this kind of brown and a bit lumpy is because it's corroded in the ground over time. You can see it's now in two pieces, but originally this would have been a very shiny iron weapon that was made with a technique called pattern welding, which is quite complicated, but it basically involves the twisting of iron rods and the grouping together of a bunch of these, which are then hammered and then create these beautiful patterns inside the blade. So originally this would have been quite a piece of work. Then up this end we have the various pieces of the hilt or the handle of the sword which is the part that's obviously held in the hand. So here we have the lower guard plates which are as you can see made of very beautiful lustrous gold. In the middle we have the grip which is the part that the hand holds onto and on this side um, towards me we have two decorative gold clips. And this part, which is actually going to be the part that I'm going to speak about the most today, is uh, the pommel cap, which is made from gold inlaid with these beautiful red lustrous stones, which are garnets. Now, what's interesting about the pommel is that it actually provides us with quite an intimate detail about the person that was buried at Sutton Hoo. Although the Sutton Hoo sword pommel here looks absolutely pristine, it looks almost as if it was made yesterday, it's still very shiny and, and perfect looking. In actual fact, it has one of the most striking patterns of wear of any Anglo-Saxon sword that I've ever studied or seen. So we can see that the edges of the pommel here are decorated with gold beaded wire. We can see lots of these individual beads running all the way along the edges of the pommel here. But at this end of the pommel, we can see that it's, it looks more like a flat strip. Now that was originally beaded wire, like the rest of it around here, but where the person's hand has been resting on that over time, it's actually worn flat. And where gold is quite a soft metal, it just it starts to, to flatten down and those beads start to lose their integrity and it looks more like a flat strip, which is what we can see at the very end. But interestingly, if I turn it around the other way, we can see that the mirror image part that's flat on that side, still retains its beads. It still looks quite, you know, like a, a piece of beaded wire on this side. But in order to sort of explain how this has come about, I need to bring back my trusty foam sword, which I'm sure many of you remember and enjoyed from last time. So you get to see it again. Here it is. So I'm gonna stand up again. Now, in early Anglo-Saxon graves, the sword, as I mentioned in the previous uh, episode, they are normally buried very close up to the dead person and they're normally on the left hand side of the person, so the side of wearing. So they'll be buried, you know, normally in about this location, like this. Usually also on early Anglo-Saxon sword pommels, we find that their two broad faces are decorated with different designs. So one side is normally more complicated with its decorative design than the other side. There we go. And normally it's the plainer side of the pommel that has the more um, degradation, it's more worn, whereas the other side is normally better preserved. And that's because probably the slightly less interesting face is worn on the left-hand side of the person, 
um, rubbing against their clothing. We can imagine a large cloak on the person here, and so that planar face is rubbing against the clothing, whereas the uh, more decorative face, the one that's outside so that people can admire it, is a bit more protected from that sort of thing. And so if we think that the sword is always worn with the same face looking outwards, then the same part of the top of the pommel is always angled upwards, and as I mentioned in the previous episode, that's the part that the hand is resting upon, and so over time we can see how that side of the pommel is just going to become worn, and this part is more protected from that type of wear. So, that's what we have. When we go back to Sutton Hoo, things start to get a little bit weird. So, we might not quite be able to see, but I assure you that it is the case. The two faces of the Sutton Hoo sword pommel are differently designed. So, it's, it's quite subtle, but it is there. So, if you focus in particular on the little cross motif that's in the middle, we can see that that's surrounded by a greater number of cells of, of differently shaped garnets than, if I spin this around, the other side. So we have a slightly more complex face on this side. There, it's a slightly more complicated design. If that more complicated design is facing outwards and the sword is worn on the left-hand side in the Sutton Hoo sword case, then the wear pattern is actually in the wrong place. The wear is actually underneath, which is you know, the part of the sword that would be more protected. Now, that kind of messes with my lovely pattern a little bit. But if we switch the sword over to the opposite side, onto the right hip, and we have that more complex face looking outwards, then actually the wear on the Sutton Hoo sword pommel is facing upwards where the hand would rest upon it and lo and behold it fits with the profile again. And what that means potentially is that the person who was carrying the Sutton Hoo sword was left handed. Now, that's obviously very interesting, a very intimate detail about the person that was buried at Sutton Hoo. And we do actually find some corroboration for this theory in the grave plan at Sutton Hoo. So famously no human remains were found in the Sutton Hoo ship burial, but what we do have is a sort of human-sized void or gap inside the burial chamber with the grave goods laid out around it. And the Sutton Hoo sword is, is laid out in the position that we might expect to find a human body. If we imagine a human being back into that gap that I mentioned, then the sword is actually found on the right-hand side, the side of wearing if the person was left-handed. So with the wear pattern on the Sutton Hoo sword pommel and also with the grave plan at Sutton Hoo, we're starting to build a case that maybe this person was actually left-handed. And I'm sort of fairly, fairly comfortable with that idea. Now, this is very interesting because it starts to make us think a little bit about how this person may have been perceived in society. Now, there's been a bit of a historic stigma surrounding left-handedness in, in many places around the world throughout time. And to some degree, the idea that being a left-handed is uh, somewhat of a disadvantage um, is still, still part of, of society, really, because society is, is geared up for the right-handed majority. But I can think of one situation in which perhaps actually being left-handed in early Anglo-Saxon England may have been an advantage, and that's in combat. Now, I actually have some very limited experience of this sort of thing because I'm a very, very rookie boxer. So, most boxers are right-handed, including me, the orthodox stance. And uh, that means that most boxers, whether they are right or left-handed, are used to facing right-handed opponents. And so the hardest punches are coming from the right-hand side. Now, if you're left-handed or southpaw stance, everything is opposite. So when you're facing a left-handed person, it's a completely different prospect. Then that kind of throws you off a little bit. And it's only in those split seconds where you kind of adjust and you have to um, compensate for that. That's all the time that is needed in actual fact for that person to put your lights out. I'm wondering if it could have been similar in the early Anglo-Saxon period. So, of course, these are different styles of fighting, boxing and sword fighting. They're not the same thing. But actually, I would argue that the principles could be the same. This idea of, of being used to a right-handed fighter and then being faced with a left-handed fighter. And in actual fact, some of the reenactors that I've spoken to talk about this very thing. So they, they say that you expect, as a sword fighter, um, sword strikes to be coming in from a certain angle. And so you stand, you hold your shield in a way that can compensate against that. But when you're actually facing someone left-handed, the sword strikes are coming in from the complete opposite direction, and that's a bit of a nightmare, quite frankly, to face. And it's similar, I think, with boxing when you're faced with a left-handed handed southpaw fighter. 
So in actual fact, the person buried at Sutton Hoo may have been viewed as even more powerful, even more formidable, rather than being at a disadvantage. And the way that the grave is laid out is also really interesting in this respect, because it shows us that the mourners burying this person didn't feel the need to correct that left-handedness by placing the sword on the orthodox side, on the left-hand side, at the side of wearing if you were right-handed. In actual fact, they chose to enshrine that left-handedness by placing the sword on the right-hand side, the side that that person would have worn it, in this very public, very, very visual context of the funeral. This left-handedness is, is shown there for eternity in the grave. Now, when I first put this theory together and I noticed these things about the sword and, and what they might mean, I had a little electrical moment because Sutton Hoo is one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time and the mystery at the very heart of it is who was the person that was buried there? You know, was this person a king? If so, which king? What was that person's name? And sadly, I think these might be unanswerable questions. We might never know who this person was. But when I look at the sword, I actually feel a lot less sad about that because by looking at these signs on the sword and, and the signatures of wear on this pommel here, we actually get such an intimate detail that this person may actually have been left-handed, which is really incredible to me. And it shows me that although these objects might sit quietly in a display case, these are not actually quiet objects. They're really full of messages. They're loud with information about the people in the past. And the other thing that I find amazing about this wear pattern on the sword is that these marks were made by this person's actual hand. You know, how close can you get? You know, by touching those wear patterns, we're almost touching that person's hand through time. So even though this person is a mystery to us and is separated from us by 1,500 years or so, we can really still actually almost reach through time and touch that person's hand and, and get to know that person in a really intimate way. By the way, if you haven't made the link, they're all left-handed. Now, if you've enjoyed my corner today, you can find my previous Curator's Corner over here, all about early Anglo-Saxon swords. And if you like that, please also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find many more wonderful videos. <laughs>